we will begin properly. Uh, so welcome to this Unlock Democracy webinar uh, on what's next for UK democracy. Um, the structure will be a brief introduction from me, followed by uh, uh, 10 minute speeches, I guess, from our two guests. Uh, then I'll ask a few questions and then we'll open it up to questions from the floor. If you have a question for our panel, you can put it in the Q&A box, which you can access uh, if you click on the Q&A button in your Zoom window. Um, and we will pick uh, a few from there. If you just want to chat with other attendees, feel free to use the chat. Um, but any questions go in the Q&A box. Um, we will finish uh, by eight o'clock and we are recording this to go up on YouTube later on. Uh, I think that's everything housekeeping wise. So we will begin. Um, so with the general election over and the new government firmly in place, we decided it would be good to have an event taking stock and looking at uh, what's, what's coming next in the world of democratic reform, where are all the main parties at. Um, and our guests tonight to help us discuss that are Josiah Mortimer and Lord Newby. So Josiah Mortimer is chief reporter from the uh, UK political outlet Byline, Byline Times. He joined in 2023 after he worked for uh, in local journalism for My London. Before that, he was a freelance journalist and worked for the Electoral Reform Society uh, for seven years. He reports on UK cronyism, the constitution and campaigning. Um, he also writes the Byline Times monthly column on the ground, which appears in the print edition and sits on the steering committee of the UK Open Government Network. Lord Newby is the leader of the Liberal Democrats in the House of Lords, which is a post he's held since 2016. Before that, uh, he has a, a long career covering um, many areas, including consulting on cons corporate social responsibility, working on programmes which use the power of sport to help motivate and educate children and young people. And he has also held the posts of uh, Lib Dem Chief Whip in the Lords and Deputy Government Chief Whip in the Lords. So we're going to start with uh, Lord Newby, over to you, your thoughts on what next for democracy. Thanks very much, Grace. Um, the interesting thing about um, uh, the Lib Dems and constitutional reform is that, um, first of all, we, we like talking about it. Um, and secondly, uh, we don't have any rows about it or very, very few. So um, I was in charge of our manifesto process and we actually approved the, the constitutional reform chapter uh, of our manifesto last September um, before our conference, because we were we knew we were going to have an, a, an election at some point this year and we wanted to get various things out of the way. We decided to start with the easiest, which was constitutional reform. Um, and um, it uh, required virtually no change from what we've done in, in previous uh uh, elections because we've had a settled view about the need for PR uh, for Westminster and local elections for the House of proper House of Lords reform uh, and for a whole raft of um, um, other changes, um, some of which uh, Labour are doing, uh, many of which they're not. Um, in terms of what do I think is, is likely to happen, um, I'll come to House of Lords reform uh, in a minute, but uh, I think the one significant change that Labour will make uh, is that I think that they will legislate uh, for votes at 16, um, which is, uh, a, a, in my view, a very long overdue reform. One of the things I do a bit uh, is to uh, go around schools uh, and talk to them about politics. And um, there is a lot of interest already but I just think that if if schools can be uh, having their pupils actually participating in ballots, it would force the schools uh, to tell them what it was all about. Uh, and and uh, if anybody who goes canvassing will know that you meet um, a small but distressingly um, regular number of people who say they're not going to vote because they don't know enough about it. And I just think the way you get people to know something about it, like you do about most things, is that you teach them about it. Uh, and so the votes at 16, I think, is a big 
um, uh, plus uh, for democracy. And uh, although you know, the Tories will portray this as being something that Labour are only doing because it's sort of, you know, they're always going to vote Labour. Um, uh, a, that's not true. But B, uh, it's worth doing whoever people vote for. Um, and indeed, as we've seen in other parts of Europe, uh, some of the right wing populists have been extremely successful at getting uh, young people to support them. So uh, it's it's a, uh, a false uh, uh, counter argument to say you shouldn't people give people a vote uh, because they might not vote for people you want them to vote for. Um, it's if you put it like that to any other group in society, um, it would be ruled out as being ridiculous. So so I think that's a good thing. Um, they're clearly not going to do anything uh, on PR, <clears throat> uh, despite the majority of people in the Labour Party uh, wanting to do it. Um, at one level, uh, it would be you know, very uh, courageous with a huge majority to legislate for PR. But on the other hand, if you've got 33.7 percent of the vote, you know that that majority is an extraordinarily fragile majority and that there may come a time in the not too distant future um, when having PR um, apart from any merits it has on its own, uh, would be uh, a, a bit of a life belt for the Labour Party. Anyway, you know, they're not going to do it. Um, so that brings us to the one thing that they are going to do. Uh, they are going to reform the House of Lords and th their plans for reform are in three parts. The first part, which has started, uh, is that they're going to get rid of the uh, remaining 88 hereditary peers. Um, this is obviously a very, very uh, long overdue uh, thing. Uh, looking at a, a, a relatively recent article by Meg Russell, the only country which she has identified which has hereditary members in its parliament, other than the UK, uh, is Lesotho. Uh, and I believe that they're mainly tribal chiefs uh, rather than uh, the rather motley collection of uh, people who are hereditary. I say motley to the extent that their backgrounds are very different um, uh, than, than the popular perception. Most of them don't come from long established families. An awful lot of them uh, come from families um, who were got a, a hereditary peerage in the 50 years before life peerages were even possible. Um, so <clears throat> the, the idea, <clears throat> as some people, uh, including Andrew Roberts in a wonderfully ridiculous article in the uh, Daily Mail recently, that the hereditary peers in some sense represent continuity with Magna Carta, uh, as if that in itself was a qualification for being in, in Parliament, uh, doesn't obtain. <clears throat> the effects of um, uh, um, getting rid of the hereditaries are good uh, in terms of uh, democracy, but it's also good for Labour in that there are 45 Tory hereditaries and four Labour hereditaries, and one fell swoop, uh, getting rid of the hereditaries will halve the disparity in numbers between the Tories and Labour, which currently uh, is at 90. The Tories have 90 more people. So this is going to happen over the next few months. <clears throat> the Tories will kick up something of a fuss, um, but uh, most of their arguments um, have literally no foundation at all. The one I most liked in, in a litany of arguments for retaining the hereditaries in, in the Andrew uh, Roberts piece was that it would leave the king isolated because the king will be the only re other remaining part of the British constitution, which was hereditary. Um, and in the absence of uh, supporting hereditaries in the laws, the poor chap, as he has his boiled eggs in the morning, would think, my goodness, I don't have anybody supporting me on the same principle of which I am king. Somehow, I don't think that that cuts the mustard. There's one thing that Labour, uh, which the government might do, which will ease the passage uh, through the House of Lords, which will be to give the Tories and indeed themselves and us and the crossbenchers, the crossbenchers having 33 hereditaries, um, a, 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 an allocation of new peers so that um, uh, the more um, influential and active hereditaries could come back as life peers. And that would be quite a shrewd thing to do because I, I haven't absolutely analysed it, but I think 
certainly if you said to the Tories, you know, you can have half a dozen, um, that would deal with their most prominent active hereditaries. And the same uh, would apply uh, to the crossbenchers. And, and obviously, we've only got four hereditaries, so we're not hugely impacted. But some of them are more um, uh, active than others, and some uh, would be a real loss, and some expect to go, I think. So that's the first thing that the, the um, <clears throat> excuse me, the government's going to do. The second thing they're going to do, uh, and they're committed to doing the manifesto, is to introduce a retirement age. Um, the, the age that, at which they're proposing people should retire uh, is the election after which people have become 80. Now, this is very old, 80 plus. Uh, until you look at the number of people who are in the Lords and active in the Lords who are over the age of 80. So um, in a couple of weeks, we've got a, uh, a retirement party uh, for Dick Tavern, who is one of my colleagues, who has decided that the 96th birthday was the appropriate point for him to retire. Now, I don't think there's another institution in Britain uh, which allows you to be an active member to that age. And whilst Dick is mentally as vigorous uh, as he's ever been, many people at that age who want to hang on are not. Uh, and so having a retirement age makes absolute sense, and the sooner they do it, the better. What worries me slightly uh, is that they've said they're going to consult on it. Now, the trouble about consulting on anything to do with Lord reform is everybody falls out uh, and about the details. And what you really need, in my view, is the government just to make its mind up about how it wants to do it uh, and do it. Uh, and if it's doing uh, the uh, abolition of the hereditaries this session, it should do the retirement age the next session um, and just get on with it. Beyond that, the manifesto has a wonderfully vague sentence about, in the longer term, uh, abolishing the House of Lords in its current form and re replacing it uh, with a chamber which more re accurately reflects the nations and regions of the UK, which... It sounds at first sight as though it may be uh, a nod towards an elected House of Lords. Unfortunately, um, the proposals that Gordon Brown brought forward for a reformed House of Lords were thought by most people, um, not least all the Tory, all, all the Labour peers that I've spoken to, uh, to be quite wacky, uh, and and uh, for reasons that I'd be happy to go into, but. Um, uh, he he's actually done a disservice in my view because his his view about how you would have a smaller uh, partly elected House of Lords uh, was clearly going to be unacceptable. So they've kicked that completely into the long grass. They're going to consult on it uh, and don't uh, expect, in my view, to see anything on that this Parliament. However, getting rid of the hereditaries and um, uh, uh, having a retirement age at 80 would be the biggest reform in the House of Lords since the Blair reforms when the majority of the registries um, uh, were got rid of. So um, it'd be well worth doing and we'll strongly support it. So I think, Grace, that's roughly where we are. Great, thanks for that. And we'll definitely come back to some of those points in the, in the Q&A. Um, if you do have any questions that you want to put to the panel, uh, please do put them in the Q&A box. We've got a couple already of good ones come in and you can also vote for your favourite questions. So don't don't miss the opportunity to do that. Um, Josiah, over to you. Uh, Ten minutes on what next for UK democracy. Thanks very much for that. And um, yeah, really good overview of Lib Dems, uh, what happened there and also... Um what's actually happening practically on, on uh, Labour's policy agenda. Um, I, I wanted to talk a little bit about um, the sort of what what the party leaderships were, were actually saying about democracy. And obviously we can contrast that slightly with um, with what's actually happening. Um, but yeah, with the Lib Dems, um, you know, just combing through uh, a Davies speech and, and watching it at the time, uh, a lot of his focus around democracy was about sort of, you know, the Conservatives' incompetence at governing, um, didn't refer to many specific uh, reforms in that speech, but as as um, Lord Newby laid out just there, we know that Lib Dems are very committed to political reform. Um, and they did pass a, a, a motion called Fair Votes Now, which I think it was probably the only bit of controversy over constitutional issues that was at, at Lib Dem conference. Essentially, there was a, and stop me if this is too wonky, there was a debate over whether uh, the Lib Dems should back the additional uh, 
not additional member system, the additional uh, vote, alternative vote, sorry, plus system. Um, so a sort of uh, way of making AV more proportional. Um, and the Lib Dems ended up sticking to their guns and uh, sticking with the single transferable vote, that multi-member PR system. So um, a nice little uh, super democratic, slightly geeky um, spat, but uh, Lib Dems uh, went with went with their instincts and what they've backed in the past on that. Um, but also, obviously, um, backing issues like automatic voter registration. Um, the motion included um, a call to beef up the Electoral Commission, basically to re uh, repeal some of those um, reforms, what the Conservatives would call them reforms, others would call it a power grab on the Electoral Commission that was passed under uh, Boris Johnson. Um, and some of that included things like um, the government can now set a strategy um, that directs effectively what the Electoral Commission focuses on. Um, and there are also more government appointed members now on the body which oversees and scrutinises the Electoral Commission. So um, Labour did oppose those changes uh, at the time, not very loudly. And, and of course, now that's not really something that Labour seems to be focusing on. I think often governments uh, get in, perhaps, you know, they see these anti-democratic reformers that were passed under uh, their predecessors and think, oh, actually, that was we, <laughs> that's quite useful for us now. Um, so we might see, you know, Labour directing the Electoral Commission on things like uh, voter registration um hopefully nothing too sinister but um as we know when, when governments do have these powers there is always that um that tendency there um also in that lib dem uh that lib dem motion which was passed um backing for citizens assemblies another uh, issue i know unlock democracy have been um uh sort of backing in the past um so there's a bit of a deliberative shift um from the lib dems and i think that does fit in with their sort of um, general e ethos around dem democracy and, and devolution and citizen participation. Um, also, at, at Labour conference, um, slightly different, different approach, different, different focus. But again, there was that theme of restoring trust in in politics that that Ed Davey kind of echoed. Um, for Keir Starmer in his speech, it was really about sort of the way of doing that wasn't so much political reform but kind of getting stuff done and being uh you know in his eyes a kind of effective government so for labor they seem to be suggesting that you know the way to restore what is rock bottom trust in in democracy and, and the institutions of democracy is is just to be really effective at, at doing what you promised during the election campaign rather than deal with many of these sort of underlying structural issues which a lot democracy and, and others have campaign so much on um but of course well you know while well, Keir Starmer was delivering this speech behind it were these stories about dodgy donations um and freebies you know whether it's paying for Keir Starmer's sunglasses or, or clothes for for his wife um so it kind of you know there was that, that undertone really of you know it's not actually just all about getting done what you say you're going to get done you also have to sort of um act and and, and represent those values as well um, but he did talk about avoiding the politics of easy answers, in his words. Um, he spoke very tough on uh, the rioters, saying that was a sort of uh, slight reflection of uh, the breakdown of, of society and, and trust in democracy. Um, and he echoed that phrase that the Brexit crowd often love to use of take back control, which um, I don't think we can necessarily take as a hint of being, uh, you know, Labour planning to uh implement what you know wide-ranging political reforms but um you know for a, for a sense of that i think we could turn a, a bit more to lucy powell who's the house of commons leader she was a bit more specific on um those reforms that lord newby was talking about uh, just before um she did ple pledge to bring back uh respect and trust in politics and um, particularly calling out sort of tory sleaze over the past uh decade um those covid corruption scandals and um, the PPE fast lanes. Um, as I say, she did a, set out a few specifics, some of which has already started to happen. So um, there was very early on uh, in the first month or so of Labour's uh, new government, um, some action on clamping down on second jobs, the rules around MP second jobs. Uh, lobbying has been slightly restricted or more restricted now uh, in terms of work that MPs can do. Um, Lucy Powell has also set up a committee uh, to sort of clean up parliamentary standards and culture, um, which involves people from the Lib Dems, uh, Labour, Conservatives, 
And I don't, I think it was just those three parties and there's been a little bit of unrest about that in terms of, you know, if those parties only represent sort of 50, 60% and then there's, you know, 40% of the electorate kind of left out of the modernization committee, then, you know, there's going to be issue, these issues around um, proportional voting that, that will probably get left off. But it's mainly about updating commons procedure and standards, I think. So expect a little bit more action on second jobs. Um, House of Lords reform, obviously, um, uh, Dick's already or, already covered some of that, um, but Lucy Powell did did touch on that. Obviously, not quite going into um, some of the detail on on what that would actually involve, which it is a bit more limited than uh, much more limited, I should say, than than Gordon Brown's proposals, which now do seem to have been kicked slightly into the long grass. But a um, little bit of watch this space on that front, and then the other sort of only concrete co commitment uh from lucy powell and, and keir starmer on this front was um commitment to a, a hillsborough law so um this duty of candor for public servants when they're engaging with inquiries and things like that to um to tell the truth which you think would be quite obvious um there isn't there isn't that duty uh necessarily placed on on politicians <laughs> this is public servants um but I, we can chat a little bit about uh, proposals to to um make that apply to politicians perhaps in the q a um I would like to give a shout out to, to the Green Party, um, who are obviously similar, many similar policies to uh, Lib Dems on political reform in terms of backing, obviously, proportional representation, uh, a full Lords overhaul. Um, but they they did a panel on media reform as well, which which is off left off uh, the agenda, I think, for many of the other conferences. Um, Byline were part of that, but some strong proposals on sort of breaking up those big media monopolies. Um, and seeing that as part of our, you know, sort of democratic makeup, the state of our media um, having a big impact on our political debate and um, and the quality of our of our politics, I suppose. Um, but coming now to the Tories, which is today, Tory leadership speeches, those four contenders um, setting out their stores on on uh, well, I would say on political reform actually, really. Um, I was just flicking through some transcripts from, from it as well as watching it earlier. And um, I don't think the word democracy was mentioned by any of the four conservative leadership candidates. So that's Tom Tugendhat, seen as a modern, uh, slightly moderate person. Um, James Cleverley, the former Home Secretary. Robert Jenrick, uh, obviously former immigration minister. He's playing very much to the right of the party. And Kemi Badenoch, who um, uh, is, again, playing up as this sort of anti-woke um, contender She's faced a bit of controversy in recent days, obviously, that might have hurt her chances, but I don't think she stands necessarily much of a, a chance in getting to the final two, um, having to get past the, the MPs, basically, to get into that final two to then go to members. Um, but one by one, let's rattle through them very quickly. Tom Tugendhat um, didn't offer anything in the way of plans for political reform in his leadership pitch. Um, James Cleverly, uh, he definitely played to the gallery um, he his one mention of democratic adjacent issues was um, saying he would clean up uh, candidate selection, make sure that's in the hands of Conservative Party members, um, and he had some sort of tough rhetoric on Israel and Gaza, in particular in particular Gaza protests, and um, basically backing um, his previous government's uh, anti-protest legislation. There's a hint there that he was supporting sort of um, further clampdowns on on protest. Um, then we have Robert Jenrick, um, who he went big on uh, wanting to abolish the European or repeal the European Convention on Human Rights, withdraw Britain from that. And as part of that, he he said he wants to um, repeal Tony Blair's uh, Human Rights Act, which which is that legislation uh, passed under Blair, which basically brings the ECHR into UK law into effect. Um, he wants to replace that with a new British Bill of Rights, which we have seen in Tory manifestos before. It's never quite clear how that would be different or much different to the Human Rights Act. Although there is, I suppose, a suggestion in their talk about sort of uh, security and kicking out uh, illegal migrants that it would basically only include British citizens within those rights or something of that sort. So um, a bit more of a probably a much more limited uh, version. And uh, and then he went to Harvard Culture War stuff, free speech. Um, Kemi Badenoch also um, also echoing those themes, and and she was perhaps the maybe the most worrying for unlocked democracy uh, in terms of um, 
political reform issues. Um, she does. She did say she wanted to uh, overhaul the Human Rights Act um, to make it easier to kick out, in her words, foreign criminals. Um, but then she said something interesting, which I don't know has been picked up very much uh, so far. She said she wanted a top to bottom overhaul of the British state. Um, not along the lines of the Lib Dem manifesto, you, you won't be surprised to hear, um, but putting everything in her words from the ECHR to judi judi judicial review, the courts, international treaties and more under the microscope, basically, for a, a total overhaul. I think it's kind of echoing uh, these US style claims about, you know, British institutions, obviously in the US, US institutions being overrun with sort of woke leftists, which is seeming to become more of a theme in among the conservative grassroots. Um, so we don't know how far those ideas will get, obviously, within the Conservative Party. If James Cleverly wins, um, that rhetoric might not be, uh, or certainly Tom Tugan, that rhetoric will be um, very much on the back burner. But it does represent quite a strong um, undercurrent, I think, of, of Tory party membership uh, views. So a quick sum up, I suppose, most parties paid kind of lip service to ideas about rebuilding trust and integrity. Um, Tories being Tory leadership candidates, perhaps offering the least on that front. Um, and Lib Dems and Labour kind of echoing each other's language on restoring uh, ethics, uh, accountability and integrity in British politics after the past 14 years. Um, but there's obviously still big questions about, you know, what, what the actions come out of that rhetoric, um, certainly from the Labour government. Um, as Lord Newby said, you know, there's not likely to be any action on PR. Um, will there be much more action on Lord's reform? Um, I think, yeah, we'll, we'll wait and see, but it doesn't look like that will be too extensive. I'd, I'd certainly agree with um, with Nick on uh, the idea that, you know, votes at 16 is something Labour want to push. Possibly, um, almost certainly, ramping up voter registration as well, and there should be some changes to um, voter identification, making sure that there are a few more IDs kind of included um, and accepted. Um, that's a man that, that was a Labour manifesto commitment, anyway. Um, but yeah, the real test is, of course, moving past that uh, rhetoric of restoring trust and actually seeing, um, you know, whether any political reforms um, will make it past. Uh, the Commons and the Lords, or, or even get to get to that stage in the first place. So, um, mostly over over to new PM Keir Starmer, but um, keep your eyes on on those pressure points. I think in the coming months. Thanks. Thanks, Josiah. That was great. Um, so we've had lots of great questions in the Q and A. So I am just going to ask one question myself before moving on to that, so we can fit as many in as possible. Uh, so my question is: uh, We've talked a lot about the plans that the government has for democracy or might have for democracy um what do you think uh are the kind of events and external pressures that we should be looking out for that might hinder those plans or blow them of course or conversely make uh result in the government delivering more democratic reform than perhaps they intended to um anyone who wants to jump in feel free to go for it well um... <clears throat> Politicians respond to pressure. Um, so uh, in terms of getting more rather than less, the more pressure that's put on Labour ministers and MPs by ordinary people and groups like yourself, the more influence it has. You can't quantify it. Um, and uh, sometimes it's something quirky that leads a government to decide to do something it hadn't really wanted to do. But in the absence of pressure, it won't. Um, because um, with one or two exceptions, um, I don't believe that in their heart, I don't think their hearts are really in it. Um, they might do, they're committed to doing some stuff, but there's not an awful lot they want to do. Um, in, in terms of uh, things that blow it off course, you should be all right for the first couple of sessions um, because the, with the size of the government's majority, as long as you've got something in the King's speech, uh, it's very difficult for uh, Parliament and certainly the laws really to question it. The danger always, of course, is it, it, uh, if you look at the last Parliament, uh, we had COVID, which knocked a lot of stuff 
um, back by a couple of years. That was pretty rare, though, uh, to have such a big, unexpected, disruptive force. And although foreign affairs uh, have the power to be disruptive, they shouldn't affect legislation very much because um, we are likely to be on the periphery of the international crises. We're not like we're not going to be invaded. We're probably not going to go to war. Uh, and so there will be a lot of hand wringing and a lot of expression of hopes about what might be happening. But it won't or shouldn't really affect the parliamentary timetable too much. Thanks for that. I'll, uh, I'll jump in as well. If that works. Grace. Yeah, I think um, I mean, there's a few a few things. I mean, I, someone was asking in the chat about, you know, um, reasons, reasons to be hopeful. And I think, um, you know, I think we I think everyone should sort of take uh it's easy to be cynical. Of course, politics is a is a grubby game at times. But I think the starting point is taking, you know, the prime minister um, at, at the words that he gave at, at party conference and and in the run up to the election about restoring trust and integrity in politics, and then and then judge all parties on on those sorts of <laughs> that sort of rhetoric. Um, I think the other thing to say is that you know there are now the pressure points for the Labour Party. And the organisations who are more able to pressure the Labour Party are are, are totally different from those organisations which had a voice in pushing the Conservative Party. Um, those sorts of spheres of influence have, have changed quite significantly, I think. And I, I think groups like Unlock, Unlock Democracy and others will have much more of an open door in terms of starting these conversations um, and, you know, making getting amendments uh, on legislation that is in there, you know, some legislation... Labour has committed to, you know, that that Lord Reform Bill will be an opportunity to, you know, the, the Labour Party or, you know, uh, soft left groups like Open Labour, who are much more pro PR and pro democratic, to to try and put some of put some of that pressure on in the Parliamentary Labour Party and and try and get, you know, some more UD friendly uh, reforms passed. So, I think those are sort of really key um, pressure points, really. And and the other is. This modernization committee, which which sounds quite nerdy, I don't necessarily think it will, you know, it's not going to be ground shake, shaking stuff that, you know, lands on the front pages of every newspaper. But things around, you know, improving uh, the code of conduct for MPs to stop some of the sleaze and lobbying scandals we've seen, um, clamping down more on second jobs and, you know, conflicts of interest among um, members of parliament. Um, and also just modernizing, the, you know, the House of Commons, making it actually work for you know people who have children or caring commitments um you know opening up other ways of, of voting and engaging when people can't get there so i think those are kind of certainly for for democracy campaigners those are little glimmers of glimmers of light i'd say and yeah definitely no no reason to be in despair um i think it would be worth seeing where this uh donation and cronyism scandal that keir starmer is facing actually gets to obviously we've seen him to give him give back today that six thousand pounds from i think from lord ali um so you know is that is that really going to knock this issue on its head or is there going to be scandal after scandal along these lines um in the next few years and labor might just say look we're going to tidy up the rules so that we don't end up having these you know facing these scandals all the time um so we'll see Great, thanks for those answers. Um, the next question, we've had a couple of people asking actually about the UK constitution. Um, so someone uh, referred to the idea of political education. How can we teach the constitution when it is unwritten? And somebody else was asking, why do we not still not have a written constitution? And are there any serious discussions on changing this? Well, the answer to the second question is no, there aren't any serious discussions. I mean, it's been our policy to have a written constitution for donkey's years, but um, nobody much has shown any interest in doing it. Um, and uh, despite the fact that Boris Johnson pushed um, uh, the, the limits of an unwritten constitution to breaking point, an unwritten constitution only works uh, because an unwritten constitution is convention-based rather than rules-based. It only works if people follow the conventions, and he didn't in quite a number of respects, like the prorogation of Parliament. So uh, th there's a strong argument for a written constitution, but no appetite for it, in my view. Um, 
in in terms of uh, uh, teaching people about how the system works, I don't think there's a problem about not having a written constitution. It's it's relatively uh, straightforward to explain. I think the main rules under which we operate, but um, uh, it needs a commitment um, from starting with government um, that. Um, uh, schools should be encouraged to do it. That's where, as I said earlier, that's the great advantage of the votes at 16. Um, we've been very bad compared to a lot of countries at teaching civics. Um, and um, hopefully, votes at 16 will will nudge people at the very least uh, to do that and take it seriously. Just to jump in there as well, I think... Um... Yeah, this is certainly with votes at 16 passing for UK general elections. I mean, there's going to need to be, you know, a proper talk about uh, improving civics and citizenship education. Um, I mean, it is, I think, just so lacking, certainly in England. I think in Scotland, it's a bit stronger and they do have votes at 16 there for uh, local and, and store, um, it's not store month, and Holyrood elections. Um, Wales now has, you know, votes at 16 for local elections as many and, and, uh, and for the Senate as well, which many of you will know, um, but they've just got a new curriculum in in Wales, which I think has quite a strong commitment to um, sort of civics ed education. The only problem I've heard from people speaking, uh, working in the sector in Wales, is that a lot of the teachers just don't feel confident teaching them stuff this stuff themselves. And actually, there's a real program to sort of train teachers in you know um, what good civics education really looks like. Um, we've got a curriculum, I think, review going on now in, in England, actually. Um, so that, that I think, will be an opportunity to try and integrate some of these conversations and say, look, 16 and 17-year-olds are getting the vote. We're going to need, you know, proper to, to raise the level of, of education on these really crucial issues. Because one thing we come across, um, not just as journalists, but, I mean, anyone working in this space is that, you know, when you talk to lots of members of the public, the, um, there are just quite basic things unfortunately which um you know just haven't haven't carried across about how our democracy works and some of that is because uh <laughs> it's almost like it's designed that way um but yeah sure great thank you for those answers um i'm going to move on now to talk a bit about uh devolution the government's devolution agenda and responses to that uh some people have been asking about it um so to what extent does the panel think that devolved powers will be increased during this parliament um and what are some of the other parties saying about devolution at the moment let's go first on that one yeah um yes english devolution is is something that was in the the king's speech an english devolution bill so um labor are basically committed to rolling out devolution in, in every part of England. And I think last week, the Deputy Prime Minister, Angela Rayner, basically said that all of the North now had signed devolution deals. Um, so we can expect quite a lot of uh, sort of pace to, to that push. Um, I think there's still big parts of um, Southeast, uh, Southwest that don't have devolution deals um, or, or, you know, not what they want so far. Um, maybe a, a stick in the craw slightly is whether um, or flying the ointment, I should say, of, of that push is, is whether Labour will still insist on having mayors to get more, for local areas to get more devolution. I know in Cornwall, where, where I'm from, that is, a, that is a sticking point, basically. Cornwall don't want a mayor, and there'll be other, other areas which I think will probably feel similarly. But um, Labour will certainly you know, be looking to what it sees as the success of Labour mayors in Manchester, Andy Burnham, you know, um, Steve Rotherham in, in Liverpool and, and lots of other Labour mayors elsewhere and thinking, yeah, this is a really good way of actually not having to spend that much money, but almost cost neutral, actually, um, but also, you know, fulfilling some of Labour's aims of, of handing down power. Yeah, I, I think um, as far as the pattern of uh, subnational government in England is concerned, it's a complete dog's breakfast. Uh, and the Tories deliberately uh, pursued that dog's breakfast approach because they wanted to do as little as they could. But they were also very cynical about it because they thought in certain parts of the, of the country, mayors would give them a, a, a position which they um, uh, could benefit from. It hasn't worked like that necessarily. And uh, it, I feel particularly aggrieved as a Yorkshireman that the Tories managed to do something that no one has ever done in the history of Yorkshire. They've divided it into four. 
Um, and uh, we've got, we're going to have four mayors uh, and four bits of uh, Yorkshire, and it makes no sense. It's a, it's, it should be a county-wide thing. That, that's definitely not going to happen. Uh, the big question about all devolution is the money. Uh, you can't be an effective mayor, uh, really, unless you've got some cash to do something with and be effective with. Um, and in North, in, in North Yorkshire, which includes Hull, for example, uh, a deal was signed for, I, th I think, um, uh, £450 million worth of uh, devolution funding. Sounds good. Unfortunately, it was over 30 years. So that's £15 million a year. Um, which is not worth, you know, it's just not worth it, not worth having a mayor for. So, the, I mean, Labour have said that they're going to uh, increase the funding and the powers of uh, metro mayors and mayors. I mean, the mayor of York and North Yorkshire, whatever he is, isn't a metro mayor. Um, uh, so that would be very good. I think the other thing where we will see an improvement in the governance of the United Kingdom is I think that relations between... Westminster and um, Holyrood and uh, Cardiff uh, will be much better uh, because the, the lack of coordination there willfully and uh, the establishment of funding arrangements which were designed to bypass Holyrood in particular. I mean, a Tory minister was appointed to dish out money from us from central government funds to Scotland to bypass the Scottish Parliament. That is just really not a good way of doing things once when you've got a devolved authority, a, a devolved structure within the nations of, of Britain. And I mean, the the, uh, the Labour manifesto was pretty good about improving coordination between Scotland, Wales, England and uh, Northern Ireland. Uh, I think that will happen. Uh, and I think that that will be uh, a positive thing as well. Great, thank you. Thank you for those answers. Um, changing topic again, a lot of people are asking about um, participatory democracy, sortition, citizens' assemblies uh, to address various problems. Um, what are the chances that the government might, might end up turning to this, these kinds of methods to address uh, polarizing issues what do you, what do some of the smaller parties, uh, where do they stand on, on this? Um, Josiah, do you want to go first on this one again, actually? Yeah, sure. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting one. I mean, my my gut feeling is that, again, um, you know, Labour figures would be more open to this than Conservatives, although that isn't necessarily saying a lot when, you, when it comes to issues of democratic reform. Um, but, you know, there are people like... Um, you know, Georgia Gould, who was, she was the uh, leader of Camden Council. Um, she's now a cabinet office minister. So working on some of these issues. And I think, you know, her instincts are um, probably more in line with these sort of open deliberative processes. I think, you know, something like sortition for, or, you know, a sort of House of Citizens, as I think it's sometimes known for the House of Lords. Um, I think, you know, that's, that's not on Labour's radar really for, um, not even for the long term, really. Um, and I think, again, there is that reluctance to, you know, it's it's different moving to, for example, an elected House of Lords, where parties still have quite a lot of control, to moving to one which is composed, you know, entirely of citizens and parties lose all of that potential control. And I think parties without a very strong, without being, you know, sort of it being hoisted on them, be very reluctant to to get behind that. Um, it's not to say it's not a good idea. You know, I think there's um, there's really strong, case for it in many in many respects but um i don't think labor will get on board with it i mean one area where they might experiment um is things like citizens juries so you know you, you sort of pick an issue um you know or you do a sort of consultation on a form on a piece of legislation that adopts more of these kind of um engaging processes we have maybe a they probably call it a jury let's face it because it's more often easier for people to understand that way but ordinary citizens get around the table and explore the issues in detail and, and come up with recommendations so you know those sort of a uh, bit more um what's the word zoomed in uh areas of policy would would might, might be one place where they do it i would point to some let councils like uh, waltham forest as well and lambeth where they've actually done citizens assemblies on things like climate and i think it was hate crime in, in waltham forest so there are people doing this locally but yeah whether that turns into national 
uh, political action. I'm, I'm slightly more cynical. Yeah, I've, I've become an advocate of uh, citizens' assemblies in some respects because um, there, are, there are clearly some issues which Parliament has proved completely incapable of adequately addressing, of which at the moment assisted dying is the most obvious. Um, and uh, it seems to me that where politicians find it difficult, as we've seen in Ireland on, on abortion and other things, where politicians find it difficult to be open and straightforward with, uh, on, on, on one of these very contentious issues for fear of being roundly abused by the other side, taking it away for a, for a, 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 a more rational discussion uh, has a lot to recommend it. I, I'm also a great fan of citizens, um, uh, you can call them juries or assemblies or, or what um, uh, uh, you want, uh, in terms of action on climate change. Um, I think that some place, I think Leeds had one, um, but I think trying to get, get, get the issue debated in a, in a more open and less partisan way is a good thing. But I also think that uh, people, citizens, uh, are, uh, as a whole, are often more progressive in, in terms of being prepared to embrace change when there's a, a rational argument for it than politicians are, because politicians, uh, and, and this isn't a partisan point, um, fear um, the enraged minority. Uh, and... Um, uh, a citizens' uh, assembly gets over that. So I, I don't think we're going to see them sprouting everywhere, uh, but I do think um, it would be extremely useful and interesting if the government were to take some issue. And I, I think assisted dying is, is, as it were, the ideal issue for this, and put it through that citizens' discussion process. Yeah, for sure. There's a there's a, a role for citizens assemblies to play for those very contentious issues. Um, I think it's worth. I desire I referred to this a little earlier, but it's worth going back to the uh, freebies scandal, if you want to call it that. Um, this has been something that sort of dominated the headlines for Labour in the last few weeks, prep, uh, which. Uh, uh, has been surprising to some people um, but how can Labour act to kind of get a grip on this in terms of advancing their sort of cleaning up politics agenda that they they talked about during the election campaign um, who wants to jump in on that yeah I'm happy to quickly um, I think yeah so one of my byline colleagues calls it the great noticing suddenly uh, newspapers are up in arms about donations and cronyism and corruption, which um, they were slightly more reluctant to cover for the last 14 years. But um, the great noticing has happened and now uh, these issues are are on the agenda now that Labour are in power. Um, I think, yeah, I think Labour do need to, they need to nip it in the bud. I mean, I, I think some of the, you know, scant, some of the scouts, some of the allegations that have emerged, you know, they do pale in comparison really to some of the, um, you know, PP fast lanes, you know, to government pals and donors, um, you know, ennobling people who, you know, have, have donated huge sums or, or giving them senior government jobs. Um, you know, that hasn't really happened so far under Labour. But, you know, they can they can take they can try and take the high road on this and say, look, you know, we we own up. This is an issue for us and it is for all parties. Um, there is actually a, you know, they could get away with doing it under well, I think they could do it anyway. But um, there is a, a manifesto, part of Labour's manifesto, which says um, they'll they'll clean up. I can't remember the exact wording, but it's um, you know they'll make some reforms to political funding. So there's scope to do that. Um, and I think they just need to seize the mantle and basically say, look, let's let's knock this on its head and and do it and take the reins. Um, Dick might be more able to tell me whether that's whether they need to sort of introduce a new bill in the King's Speech or something. But there's probably stuff they can do without primary legislation. But um, I will hand over to yeah. I, 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 don't, I don't think legislation is is really required um because the problem that they've got into with Wahid Ali isn't one of uh, misbehavior but of political perception I mean Wahid Ali doesn't want a peerage he's got one Wahid Ali uh, wants a labor government wanted a labor government 
Uh, and like a number of very wealthy people, if he sets his sights on somebody and he sees that the, 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 the achievement of that girl is being, in his view, um, made less likely because of financial things that he can sort out, he just says, well, do that, go on, off you go. Um, and it's for the politician in those circumstances uh, uh, where what's being proposed is not illegal or um, improper under the rules, just to uh, have the Daily Telegraph test in their minds all the time. You know, I am a Labour leader. Uh, how does it look if I'm taking £32,000 for my clothes? Um, and I don't think that you deal with that by legislation. Uh, you need you deal uh, by that, with that by uh, people setting an example and sticking to it. And that's what, you know, you can't legislate for trust in politics. Politicians just have to be trustworthy and behave in a trustworthy manner. And that's what we should expect of them. Um, and they've uh, fallen short over the years. But the last parliament was a, an, an absolute nadir. Uh, and um, uh, it's, it's for politicians to look themselves in the mirror and say, OK, it, it, if, if they have problems with their moral compass, which um, clearly some have had in the past, they need to apply a political test. If, if they don't, they just apply the moral test. What do I think is the right thing to do in a democracy? Uh, and I, I think that, um, I don't think this government is, is made up of corrupt people. Um, they may have slightly had their head turned by somebody's offering them things. Including, you know, if you're invited to every uh, sporting occasion or uh, pop concert that you might conceivably want to go to, don't agree to go to them all. <laughs> it just look, it's the optics are just terrible, um, and and they've got to look at themselves really, and and change has got to come, I think, from from those individuals principally rather than more legislation. Great. Yes, thank you. I, sorry, Grace, I just wanted to add something very quickly to that, which I completely agree with, but which I think at some point in this debate, politicians are going to have to have an honest conversation with the public and vice versa about the trade-offs involved, which is if, you know, if we want to cap donations and limit donations and stop these freebies, maybe we're going to need a little bit more public funding for politics. I actually appreciate that, that that might be needed. And, you know, whether there's an appetite for that, you know, I think actually with Maybe they could do a citizen's jury on, on issues of political funding, but they, they're going to need to have that conversation, I think, at some point. And, you know, maybe it's long overdue. Yeah, sure. Something has to give, I think. Um, OK, I'm just going to quickly ask one more question and then pass it back to Tom, uh, who will close up. So this is a bit of a wrap up question. Can the panel tell us anything that might give us hope about UK democracy in um, this is a quote, these incredibly dark times? And the asker says, I can't remember a time like it. So any reasons, rays of hope? No, I think, I think there are quite a number of uh, rays of hope. For a start, I, I think, I, I don't believe we've got a fundamentally dishonest government. That's a big change. Um, there are going to be um, democratic changes. The votes at 16 is potentially a big thing if it's coupled with proper civic education. Um, getting rid of uh, uh, the hereditaries and, and the other changes in the House of Lords, they're not in the same order of magnitude, but at least they make the system less ridiculous. Um, and those are good things. And that things like the Modernisation Committee, um, these are good things. I mean, not everything that we want is happening, but to the extent that there are changes to the way we run our democracy, in my view, they're mainly, if not entirely, going to be in a positive direction. A lot of the things that happened in the last parliament, whether it was the uh, voter ID um, or the constraints on the uh, way that the Electoral Commission operated, or the changing of the system for electing mayors, for example, were anti-democratic. Um, and we're not going to get any more of that nonsense, I don't think. And we are getting these positive things. So I give, you know, it's a sort of beta plus for democracy. Sure. Yeah, we're not moving backwards anymore. And that's something to celebrate. I think it's a very good point. Um, Josiah. No, I, I, I would agree with that. And I think, um, you know, there are, yeah, there are changes that are coming to, to democracy. And, you know, these things, uh, you, 
basically there's been a big step back i think under under the last government with changes like voter id um, and the electoral commission which lord newby just just touched on i think there will be a reversal of some of those you know changes the worst of those changes <laughs> Um, but I think some of it is about outlook. It's about, you know, how democracy is talked about, how things like the right to protest, whether we'll, you know, get loads, loads of rounds of anti-protest legislation like we saw under the last government. That isn't, you know, that isn't going to happen. Um, and hopefully with, you know, with some pressure um, from groups like ED and others, um, you know, there will be a tendency to to row back on some of that and, and you know, um, try and get citizens' rights, public rights, right to protest, free speech, uh, and proper democratic reform um, back on the agenda. And I think, yeah, the door is open to that now in a way that it just wasn't at all uh, before. Great. Thank you both um, for those rays of hope at the end there. Uh, Tom, if you're there, yes, I can see you're there. Over to you. Uh, thank you, Grace. And I uh, also wanted to thank uh, Lord Newby and Josiah Mortimer for taking part in uh, tonight's webinar. And uh, some of you will be aware that a couple of years ago, an international assessment of the UK's democracy was that we were a democracy that is backsliding uh, in terms of our democracy. I think, as both of our speakers have indicated, I think that the signs under the present government, the new government, are, are more positive. So I hope that the next international assessment of the UK's democracy will be that uh, it has stabilised and is moving in the right direction. I just wanted to make people aware of a couple of events that we've got coming up. So on the 28th of October at 7pm, as part of Black History Month, we have a, uh, another webinar and uh, details of that will be circulated to our members and supporters. Parliament Week is the 18th to the 24th of November, and either on the 20th or the 21st of November, again at 7 o'clock, we're going to have a, a webinar with some uh, young politicians, uh, the purpose being to explain why politics, contrary often to public perception, is something that people should get involved with and has the sort of... Uh, a significant uh, merit to it. And also, finally, for those of you who are uh, members of Unlock Democracy, and you could still join to be in time to join our AGM. So we have our AGM on the 16th of November. And for that, we hope to have one of the mayors uh, coming to speak on the subject of devolution. Uh, one area where I think the government are going to make progress we want to make sure that devolution isn't just about securing growth, uh, which is what the government's focus seems to be, but is also about ensuring that communities can be much more involved uh, in decision-making decision at a local level than is currently the case. So uh, we will send out information about those events, but uh, thank you all uh, for attending. Um, we had lots of questions, I'm afraid, that we couldn't answer or our speakers couldn't answer uh, but clearly there is an appetite for this sort of thing. So we will we will be returning again uh, with similarly uh, uh, qualified expert panellists. Thank you very much. See you all soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye-bye. Yeah. Thank you.